Hey folks, this is Don from BrainBlinks.com with another Mandelbulb 3D tutorial. Uh, it's not the animation one I keep promising everybody, but I'm going to do that one next, I promise. It's coming soon. Uh, but I really wanted to show you this new feature of Mandelbulb 3D that lets you basically grab highly detailed 3D mesh objects from your fractals. And it's much more accurate than the way I showed you with photo fly and kind of estimating the objects. This one basically what it does is slices up your fractal into thin slices saves them as images and then you use a, a different program to reassemble those slices into an object. And it makes fantastic shapes like here's one that came basically straight out of Mandelbulb 3D. All I did was add a little bit of the branches here and just a little bit of manipulation with ZBrush and painted it. But <laughs> you can't tell me that doesn't look like a prehistoric bush or fern or something. I'm having so much fun with this feature. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you. And everybody else at Fractal Forums who shared the steps and uh, the information they gathered while trying to figure out how to do all this. So let's get into it and I'll show you the programs you need and what to do and I have made a, a shorthand bit.ly link for all the links you need to look in the description clicky clicky and you'll find all the stuff you need okay here we go we got Mandelbulb 3D loaded up uh, this is version 1.7.6 I got a crazy looking shape here it's like an ornate cave that I found in my meanderings Let me see if I can just give you a quick view of what it looks like from a couple of different angles. So when you're ready to do, when you find a shape that you like and you want to try to capture it as a 3D mesh, what you want to do is get your camera zoomed in real close on it. Get it center frame. I usually set it up for a square frame that matches the voxel stack feature better. And you just want to get it right in the middle, right up close to the camera, so that it's basically the main focus in there. Then you hit the voxel stack button and go import parameters from main. And right now it's drawn a 128 by 128 pixel slices of this shape. Now you notice sometimes when you transfer it over here, it'll be almost exactly where your camera is and this one is actually very close sometimes it'll be way far away or it'll, you, you won't see anything um, the best thing to do in that case I found is to change this scale because a lot of times I've found that if I can't see what I'm what I thought I was gonna see I, if I zoom back a little bit with this scale button it'll uh, come into view or sometimes you have to scale in this one's looking pretty good. I generally find I have to scale out a little bit anyway. There are also controls here for up and down and in and out of the frame and left and right. So this one is a little low in the frame. I'm going to move it up. Keep in mind that it's kind of drawing the stacks of the slices from back to front so you can get a good idea of what's happening behind this shape as it draws. I usually set it on a 64 pixel or 128 pixel while I'm adjusting. And if you do the 256, it takes longer, but this is much closer to the final output and it really gives you time to see what's happening. You want to get it in the frame as good as you can. The things on the outside of this frame, near the edges, sometimes won't end up in the final render. It's not all exact from you get exactly what's in this window and this window and then in your final output. I think what I'd like to do is move this back a little bit in this 3D volume and you can do that with the Z offset. I want it to, that's kind of pushing it back and it'll give us more room in the front for the things that render. You see here if I push it up uh, way forward that it cuts off that part in the front. I'll do it even more here. It's 
See, now it's cutting off that shape before it was finished. I want to get the whole KV area, so we'll go back to zero. I just want to push it back just a little bit. It looks pretty good. Yeah, I think I'll back off on that scale just a little bit just in case to kind of keep it from the edges. Okay, so that looks like the pretty good volume, a pretty good capture of that area that I was interested in. It's probably best to start off with a very uh, a shape that's obviously sticking out or maybe even a whole mandel bulb shape or something like that when you're getting used to it. So let's look at it with the 256 again. kind of like a saddle shape inside of there. Alright, that looks pretty good. I'm going to use that. So now, what I generally do is pick a folder to put all these slices in. I generally make a new folder. Curl Cave 3. Just open that folder. And then I choose a size for the Z slices. Now this depends on how much detail you want, how much RAM you have in your computer, and how much horsepower, and uh, what your computer can handle. Uh, you can get pretty good detail just out of a five or 600 pixel slice. I found that 900 is pretty much the highest resolution I can use on my machine without bogging it down. And I've done a few that are higher, but... Um, so use a, I would suggest maybe start off with a 500 or 600 pixel when you're testing out, maybe even lower when you're testing out the first few times. I think for today we'll go with 700 on this one. Kind of split the difference so it doesn't take too long for the processing. And then just make sure this is checked, index with leading zero, and start rendering slices. And it'll start counting the slices it's rendering here, and it'll show them here. If it starts off with a blank black screen, don't worry, it's just um, some of your edges of your volume don't have uh, any data in them, any shape in them. So here you can see it's starting to find some geometry now. I believe it goes from front to back when it renders. It's kind of fun watching them. <laughs> they make some neat patterns while uh, it renders. One thing I really like about this technique is that you don't have to wait a week to get your animation. You can render a nice high quality 3D object in just you know half an hour or an hour and have the final object and then do stuff with that. It, you don't have to wait so long for the results. <laughs> so while that's rendering, I will I'm going to show you some other software that you need here. We're going to use a program called Fiji, which is an open source free image processing package. And I know nothing about it except that I can use it to process these voxel stacks into uh, a 3D mesh object. And uh, after I put it through Fiji, I've been loading it into ZBrush because that is my favorite 3D modeler. It's so amazing. And uh, using the Dynamis and other features to um, clean up the mesh and knock it down from millions of polygons down to the thousands or whatever you need to use it for your application. There's also a free option for processing the mesh called MeshLab. You can get that at meshlab.sourceforge.net and uh, it's a great program and you can load it in there, clean it up, reduce the number of polygons and then save it back out so that you can use it in whatever 3D program you want. Um, 
this technique creates meshes with millions of polygons you know and if you're not careful you'll you'll definitely make some meshes that you can't load in your computer i've the biggest one i managed i think was an 800 megabyte object file with 23 million vertices or something like that 35 million faces and zbrush managed that but uh, <laughs> and it was mostly details on inside the object that's another thing you got to be careful of and then ZBrush is is good with dealing with, and MeshLab is uh, removing all the detail that's inside some of these structures. Sometimes they're like a grid or a mesh of detailed faces, and that can just really pump up the side of your objects. So once you're finished, you'll have an image sequence, in this case 700 images that are 700 by 700 pixels. And as soon as this finishes, we'll load up Fiji and I'll show you how to use that. Okay, we got all 700 of our image slices and it's time to make a pixel sandwich. So we'll load up this Fiji app, which I know nothing about except for the fact that it lets us take these image slices and turn them into an uh, object file which is awesome. So these steps I'm going to show you here are basically the same ones that Tina shared on the fractalforums.com thread about this voxel stack. Uh, I modified it a little bit to uh, save a little memory by using just the grayscale version of an image instead of converting the RGB, but it's basically the same steps. So just basically do this exact thing and you won't even have to learn, figure out Fiji at all. I didn't. <laughs> so uh, import image sequence. Oh, I'm going to delete these. I already did this once and messed it up. So highlight the first image in the sequence that we just rendered and hit open should show here the number of images in the sequence then just click use virtual stack these two should be unchecked sort names numerically should be checked click OK then go to file and choose save as PGM I usually just save that right along with the image in the same folder then go to save as wavefront.obj change this threshold to zero I'm gonna leave the resampling factor at two today if you leave it at one you'll get a much more you'll get a more detailed mesh that has uh, way more vertices way more polys uh, resampling factor two is basically kind of a smooth version of one and resampling factor one also takes way more memory so you won't be able to do it on um, the higher resolution slices you just have to experiment with that a little bit to get the feel for what you like I'm gonna uncheck green and blue since we're just using the grayscale and along with this threshold of zero that'll allow us to use those grayscale images hit OK save your object I usually just save it in the same folder and now this is a part where I got very confused and so did several other people on the forums because Fiji here looks like it's processing and writing the object file but it's really just processing right now and when it saves the file it looks like it's finished but it's not finished <laughs> it continues to write the file for for a long time after it, it looks like it's done so it threw a lot of people for a loop while we we're trying to open up these broken files and incomplete files so what I usually do is open up the folder where I'm saving the object and then we'll open up my task manager and I can see here that Fiji is taking up some of the CPU. Okay, so now it's written object file and it looks like it's done over here in the main program. But you can see that it's still writing to the file. Right now, 3 megabytes, 17 megabytes, 21, 22... And you can see that it's still taking up CPU time. So I just wait until 
Well, on my machine, I just wait until my CPU fan stops <laughs> making a loud noise. I have a horribly loud fan, but it lets me know when my computer's working hard. So I just wait until it stops taking CPU time, or this file or stops growing. It's at 57 megabytes right now. Okay, it looks like it's done now. I can see it dropped off the list of the most used CPU. And we've got about a 59 megabyte object file. Okay, so that's how you use Fiji to take those slices and make them into an object. Let me load up ZBrush now and I'll show you what we got. Okay, got ZBrush up and going. Let's load up that object we just made. And here it is, and it looks weird. It's it's inside out, basically. <laughs> so if you go to your Tool submenu and display properties. It's also up here. Display properties. And hit flip. That'll flip all those faces around. And we got a pretty clean, good object. You'll notice these stair steps. That's a kind of a result of the process of slicing the object up into these little slices and reassembling it. If you try this on Threshold 1 when you export, you'll see that these stair steps, stair steps are kind of more emphasized and closer together. And of course, if you did this at 900 by 900 or 1,000, you know, uh, pixel slices, then these stair steps would be closer together, but they still be there. But uh, ZBrush is pretty good at getting rid of them, uh, even if you just do a simple... Dynamesh, I usually turn blur off so I can decide how much blurring and whatnot. I usually put this up around 440, 500 for a mesh of this detail. And then just hit Dynamesh. And you can see it does blur some of it. But it does a decent job of keeping a lot of the detail. And you can blur away as much of that as you want. I find that they make some pretty cool patterns, though, when you uh, use masking. Like, uh, just mask by cavity. You can get some pretty neat patterns out of these things. And even beyond these stair steps, the actual patterns that were in the fractal to begin with make for some great texturing object options but uh, that'll be a different tutorial if I get around to that I just wanted to show you the basic steps so um, let me just real quick show you in mesh lab as well even though I haven't done it too much in there but I, I can give you a heads anyway okay I want to show you at least the basics of how to do this in mesh lab too since it's free I mean M Manable 3D is free Fiji's free, this is free, might as well complete the trifecta. Now I haven't done a lot of experimenting with this, with these voxel stacks, although I did do uh, another tutorial on, uh, and put it on YouTube, of a different way I was using to create 3D meshes before Jesse added this feature. And this is still a valid method because for one reason you get the textures out of Manabob 3D. Um, with this voxel stack, you don't get a textured object. There's no UV maps or anything. But there's tips in here in this video about how to use MeshLab, and the, basically the same process that I used to clean up the mesh in there will work on this. But basically, what you do is import the mesh. If you have a very large mesh, it'll take MeshLab a while to import it, and it might look like it's stuck here, at least on my machine. It, a lot of times it looks like it's stuck at 32 or 33%. Just give it a second. So the faces are inside out here as well, so I've been going to render, lighting, double-sided lighting. I usually put it on smooth. 
So this object has right now 900,000 faces again. So the quickest way to clean it up and reduce the number of vertices without losing too much detail that I found is cleaning and repairing merge close vertices. I'm going to use 16 for this today here. Apply. Starting filter. Filter successful. Now we have 558,000 vertices and a million faces and a pretty similar level of detail. And it also gets rid of a lot of redundant things. You can also, I've noticed a lot of times these things have redundant faces. You go to cleaning and repairing, remove duplicate vertices, Filters, cleaning, repairing, remove, duplicate faces. So you got some rid of some of them. Um, now, Mesh Lab can also uh, decimate your object. Remove, you know, remove polys while keeping the detail. Does a pretty good job of it. Or it can also rebuild the mesh so it's a more coherent, um, topologically connected mesh and again watch that other video if you want details on that but just for instance let's go to uh, remeshing simplification and reconstruction quadratic edge collapse decimation engage and there it lets you pick the target number of faces so right now there's 548,000 faces let's knock it down to 100,000 and just hit apply see what happens I also like the Poisson method which kind of tries to estimate the volume of the space that you've got in there so if there's missing details or whatever it tries to figure it out so I did a you know I did an okay job uh, knocking that down now there's only 51,000 vertices instead of 900,000. So play with that and you can uh, get something that you can work with in your 3D app. I mean, that looks pretty darn good. So, and then of course, you would just go out here to uh, export mesh as. I generally go for OBJ. Okay, there you go. There's the basics of doing the voxel stack tango. <laughs> I love this. I'm so glad that they added this feature. It's so much fun. And uh, thanks for watching. See you later. Bye.